Dr. Green uh, comes to us from the University of Vermont, where she's an equine uh, extension specialist, and and um, she's very active in our NE 1441 group, uh, Environmental Impacts of Equine Operations, and she's going to clear up all the haze for us now about cloporalid <laughs> and, and uh, its influence on tomato growth. <laughs> clear up all the haze, huh? I don't know about that, but we'll see what we can do. Um, I'm actually going to talk to you about some of the different views, input, output, and everything else about uh, Vermont when we had some issues. Uh, where's our clicker here? Maybe? You didn't show me how to work the clicker. There we go. Okay, so this is the group, the players, and if you actually look at the um, Purple, those are kind of the victims of this story that I'm about to tell you. The red, I, I don't know that we'd call it the um, criminal or anything, but they, this was where the problem existed. And then the green, of course, is coming to the rescue. Uh, Vermont Center or Agency of Ag Food and Markets or the Vermont Ag Center for Agriculture. And then also University of Vermont Equine Extension. And you'll see how it lays out. What I'm going to do is show you some of the pieces that you don't necessarily get to see that don't get exposed when you're doing all of this stuff. And everything's happening. And you can see all the different inputs and outputs. So Green Mountain Compost was the company. And was that the old or the new facilities that you were showing? That's their new facility. OK. And so Green Mountain Compost and Chittenden Solid Waste District, they're kind of one in the same. The Chittenden Solid Waste District runs Green Mountain Compost. And so this is from Green Mountain Compost website. Giving a timeline, it was 2012. And that was when they first started getting reports from the backyard gardeners, the home gardeners, that plants weren't doing well when they had been treated with or had compost from that facility put on there. And, you know, they, they went out to visit and they couldn't figure out what it was, so they contacted the agency of ag and then we moved on from there and they stopped selling the compost at that point. So then they said, okay, we sent samples off to a laboratory. We sent 26 samples from you know, all the different things from feedstock, so feed, compost, shavings, manure, whatever, 26 different samples, grass trimmings, and they got results. They put, they published an online fact sheet with this, and then that's where the next victim comes in, because we had the equine industry and Vermont has a lot of everything from backyard recreational to high-level dressage and eventing to you name it, fun, adventure, showing, and all kinds of industry. But suddenly, we had a news report that said that horses were um, killing tomatoes in Vermont. So, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> and. So the guy that was managing Green Mountain Compost said, OK, on Channel 3, our Vermont news station, these facts from this one set of samples that had not been repeated from this one lab. Later on, there was a second set of samples that came back with completely different results of what was in the compost, these persistent herbicides, levels, numbers, types, whatever. We also started hearing about things like the ag agency is not doing what they're supposed to and our gardens are dying and the horses are killing our tomatoes. And Extension came in on all this stuff and we had um, Ann Hazelrig as a plant path pathologist. We had other equine, uh, myself, and we had Sid Bosworth who does agronomy. We had all kinds of folks. Um, Heather Darby, who also is an agronomist, and they were actually training folks to go out to visit these farms, or far, uh, garden gardeners actually, to see if there was actually, this was related to the compost or not. And so August 13th, and it was updated on the 15th, that's why I have it like that. And these links did work, and so hopefully if you go back and look at the slideshow, they should still work, and you can actually see this stuff. 
And this was where they, the thing was stated that horses are, you know, causing this. And so I got calls saying, hey, wait a minute, they're saying that our horses are killing these tomatoes and all this stuff, what's going on? So I talked to some folks at Channel 3 who I've worked with and, you know, know quite well and talked to, on the evening news and said, okay, let's just be clear, horses are not generating herbicide in their system, so they're not killing the plants. Okay, we, we still need to actually get some results and look further from there. And so we had the twisted tomatoes. And it was, <laughs> that was the term that kept coming up, twisted, gnarly, and all kinds of things. Had calls from the industry, had calls to the agency of ag. I talked with WCAX, which by the way, CAX, College of Ag and Extension, that's where the <laughs> call letters originated from, and that's Vermont's station. And then we started doing some proactive uh, actions to try and inform the public what was going on and why we couldn't just come up with an answer immediately as to what to do, what was causing it, how much, why, etc. It happened to be convenient that we had, um, I was hosting our national NE 1041 group, Equine Impacts on Environment Research Group in Vermont for our annual meeting. Kind of a motley crew. I don't know, some of you guys might recognize some folks in the audience. And, but it was pretty good because Vermont, being such a small state, we actually had the Secretary of Ag, Chuck Ross, and his head guy on pesticides, this Kerry Gagir, come in and meet with us. And we talked about it, and Krishona actually was talking about how they'd had these issues when people were grazing their horses down in the highway bank areas and there were persistent herbicides there and it was passing through and then killing, causing other issues. So we had a great conversation for about, what, about an hour and a half, had some good ideas for them, suggestions, and also we started looking into this. We also have in Vermont the longest running agricultural show in the country across the fence. And it's a noon show on weekdays, about 14 minutes long, and it is, um, a great opportunity to get information out because a lot of the folks at home or at noon are a rather older audience and or farmers and then we also they pass the word and say and get the word out and keep moving things forward so it's a good way to get some first education out there in front of folks and that's available Vermont of course you know southern lower part of Canada the western part of New Hampshire, eastern part of New York, etc. And so I actually worked with them quite a bit and got the producers to come interview these guys, my NE 1041 group, and they had no idea what they were getting into when they came to our national meeting in the middle of this twisted tomato crisis. So what we ended up doing, we had the first compost story where the horses were killing the tomatoes. We had the or horses, horses don't make herbicide. <laughs> or horses don't make herbicide. We had another story later on a change in the compost procedure because that Green Mountain compost actually had been located in a different place and it was running off into waterways. And so they actually built a brand new place and they changed some of their mechanisms of how they were processing the compost. We did some across the fence uh, stories, one with some of our uh, interviews from our folks here and then also I had uh, Carrie Gagir on there as well uh, the pesticide specialist to try and explain some of the things going on and why we couldn't just come up with answers and then we'll show you later an article that we ended up uh, putting out as well so this was another story you can see it was a working link hopefully it will be when it transfers to the public or to online from here but just some more information. So people say, well, if it's killing the plants, and shouldn't we be worried for the people? Well, the, le the levels of these herbicides were not worrying the health department because they, weren't, they were much less than what was allowable in water, but they were enough to kill those sensitive plants. And then when it came down to it, they started mailing out checks to these damaged people with damaged gardens or twisted tomatoes 
and other broadleaf type things. And they had a deadline. If you're wondering how much, there were about 626 complaints filed, about 510 of those were I identified to be directly related to the compost. $270,000 went to the damaged uh, gardeners. About $370,000 went towards the testing and the contact and the consulting. About $150,000 was lost due to the um, not being able to sell their product. You just heard all about selling the product and how you have to make that money at the end. So about $800,000 for this little compost company that um, was you know, pretty pretty expensive ordeal. So just some other things from Vermont Agriculture Agency of Ag, they actually sent 68 samples to another lab, a different lab than Green Mountain Compost had used. And they got back all different answers that said that the, the one amino pyrrolid and such was present and DuPont's Imprellus or amino cyclo. See, I don't, I'm, not, I'm a horse person, so you guys need to pronounce this stuff right. <laughs> and it was uh, present. And DuPont said, no, that's not true. And so then we started looking a little further. Come on. So, Vermont Agency of Ag collected nine compost samples in September 12, had homogenized them, sent the same samples to seven different labs came back with seven different answers. And so, the, and still the public saying, why isn't the Ag Agency doing anything to protect us? And so we're still having troubles. And it became quite a dilemma because they could not get a sample to match. There was no duplication as far, or repeating of results in any of these situations. And Oh, by the way, one of those labs was the EPA, and four months after the fact, they still had heard nothing. So I guess there was one that just didn't do anything, our EPA. And so Dow came in, because Dow was one of the producers, chemical producers for the herbicides, said, all right, we've got the technology. Let us try and figure this out. And they started working. They sent the 68 samples. Dow was doing the, they, you know, actually putting it through their very expensive equipment and then we're finding some consistency and re repeatability and then they're actually working with the Vermont labs to try and or the state labs to try and figure out oh I they couldn't Vermont Agency of Ag could not actually test their own samples because their people were out of their labs because Irene had flooded the state labs so they couldn't do the work themselves just in case you're wondering, this is from Kerry Gagier's, one of his reports, the active ingredients, the, man, you know, the manufacturer, the, when it was actually first registered for use, and then some of the trade, the trade names like Tordon, Grazon, Curtail, you guys can probably recognize some of these things, Forefront, the different chemicals, and Imprellus was the one DuPont was uh, not claiming. And so then you say, okay, well, maybe people are using them. Well, what level can impact that? Five point parts per billion, 10 parts per billion? Is it restricted for use in Vermont? Absolutely, on every single one of them. Pounds used in Vermont. And then pounds used actually in Chittenden County, which is where the uh, Green Mountain compost is. Zero, 1.0, zero, zero. So again, it goes back to the hay, but not just the hay. A lot of our folks get hay from Canada, New York, all over the place. But also the grain, um, it got blamed on the horses because there, you know, there's a lot of horses eating beet pulp and things like that in their grain. And some of these things are allowed on the crops, but then they stay in the feed, pass through the horses, and then cause the problems. So people may not have been doing anything wrong, but it was still causing problems. Back in April of 13, we had another story where the legislator, 
we're hearing about, is this going to kill us, <laughs> okay? Kill us or our gardens, and still. And then in May of 15, or in May of 13, we actually, you can see the authors, most of them are in that picture that I showed you. We actually put together a story. You can actually read the entire um, thing up until that time of how many different labs, what some of the results were, and things like that. It was actually pretty interesting uh, when we got everything. And then some, since then, there's actually a working compost or a compost working group. And if you look at some of the attendees in, I don't know where the, you know, Kerry Gagir, he's the Ag Agency, so Ag Food and Markets. We got Green Mountain Compost, we got Champlain Valley Compost, we've got Resource Management, we've got all different folks from lots of different places coming and talking about what can we do. And some of the more recent things, they're trying to get a horse owner pamphlet and trying to get that. These are from their notes from one of their meetings, which are online. Uh, farmer livestock pamphlet, and then uh, fixing the broken system press reliefs. So these are some of the things that they were doing to try and continue moving forward and educate folks about what's been going on. And this is kind of a draft, close to final draft of piece of one of the the booklet for the horse owners, trying to say, hey, this is what could be happening and what you need to be aware of. So again, education. And then, what can you do? What does this mean? And, you know, as far as looking at these different things, try to make sure. And I said, okay, I made some changes, said the horse people won't know this and they're not going to do it, so let's at least put stuff that they can actually do. You know, you can't I mean, all the national feed dealers were, their feeds were coming up positive for some of these. Another thing, the, uh, you know, composter alert. So just getting information out so that folks will know and people will understand. And then, I mean, the interesting part of this all was that it really showed us that we actually could get some stuff done, and it was a perfect timing for us to, our group that's working on equine environmental issues to come together and actually bring, bring some great brain power coming from different aspects and angles and experiences and maybe actually help out a little bit. So if you want, like I said, those links should be live, and if not, let me know but there's the whole story, and it's something that we're seeing a lot more of throughout the country. So I take any questions.